Welcome back to the Religious Studies Project. It's Monday, which means we have another new episode for you. I'm Andy Alexander, and with me today is... Dave McConaughey. And I'm delighted to share that we have a very enthusiastic roundtable on a subject of some controversy, which is manifestos. From Anders Breivik to the Unabomber to the Theater of Cruelty, our panelists from the University of Sydney today cover a variety of controversial manifestos and the ways in which religion and religious studies can really shed light on these documents and their creators and try to help us understand these critical sources for some of the most tragic events that have happened in recent memory. So we're very thankful for Carol Cusack and Alana Bowden and Anna Lukaitis and Sophie Rowe and Ray Radford for their comments. Let's listen in. Welcome, everyone. We are here this evening with members of the Department of Studies and Religion at the University of Sydney, and we are about to have a conversation about manifestos. We have Professor Carol Cusack, who will be talking about Debord's The Society of the Spectacle, particularly Debord's Marxist understanding of consumer capitalism and the media in the context of the consumerization of religion. Ray Radford will discuss the manifesto of Anders Breivik, a European nationalist, eco-warrior, right-wing agitator and terrorist who is most famous for the 2011 Oslo attacks. Sophie Rowe will be discussing the Unabomber Manifesto and its connection to both environmental movements and extreme nationalism. Finally, Alana Bowden will be talking about Artaud's Theatre of Cruelty, a modality of immersive total theatre beyond language and representation, which draws heavily from various religious and spiritual discourses and practices. And I'm Anna Lukaitis. I will be podcast MC for the evening. So I think it would be really interesting to start with a discussion of how we approach a manifesto, what is a manifesto in religious terms? Carol? I think, Anna, one of the useful things that we could do tonight is think about a manifesto as being somewhat akin to a creed in religion. Now, I understand that, of course, a huge number of religions never formulated a creed in any way, shape or form, but the idea which obviously links to the dominant tradition of Christianity, is that it's a statement of beliefs about the nature of reality and the universe, and these beliefs are seen to be vital, fundamental things that we have to pay attention to. And the word creed in English, of course, comes from the Latin term credo, um, the Christian creed begins, credo in unum dominam, I believe in one God, and it already positions the speaker and the audience in the frame of monotheism and of the necessity to commit existentially to that God. So I think everybody tonight will probably discover some aspect of that kind of commitment and statement of totalizing aims in every manifesto we're considering? Well, um, I was actually thinking, can a manifesto, and a secular manifesto be understood on religious terms? And then conversely, can a canonical religious text be understood as a manifesto? Because, um, as Carol's pointed out, there's a, a differentiation between a secular manifesto and a sacred creed, but is the boundary that simple? For me, because um, I'm in theatre and performance studies and studies in religion, I kind of see a slippage between um, between the two textual genres, I guess. Um, I'm sort of thinking in terms of specifically about like Luther in 1517 and the 95 Theses um, and thinking then to is a manifesto or a, a credo, is that inherently performative? Does it have to do something in the world or can it exist in thought as well? Because leading into our manifestos that we'll be discussing, um, some of them have been, I think, enacted to different degrees of lesser or greater success 
in their aspirations being realised. Yeah, Alana, maybe you could take us through Arto's Theatre of Cruelty. Yeah, if if we're ready to jump into um, our specific manifestos. So, um, yeah, as we've said, um, I'll be looking at um, Antonin Arto's uh, collective manifestos for what he termed the theatre of cruelty. Um, so the there's no one set manifesto. It was actually he wrote two manifestos and a series of different letters and essays during the 1930s, and they were collectively published in 1938 as um, Le Théâtre et son double, in French, um, or um, the, the theatre and its double. And so... Um, Artaud was a French writer, poet, dramatist, uh, visual artist, essayist, actor, and theatre director. And so, um, yeah, he's best known for his um, his manifestos around the theatre of cruelty. And so, basically, Artaud uh, was calling for a modality of immersive total theatre beyond language and representation. So um, he was closely associated with the surrealist movement and he, he railed against um, what he thought was the, um, the failure of the Western representational aesthetic literary drama of the 19th and early 20th century. So he called for a theatre which was beyond language, that was experiential, that was immersive, uh, in which the audience was physically, emotionally and psychically uh, affected as a means of creating an experience of pure presence. So um, he rejects verbal representational processes of signification um, as a means of communication and so he calls for a theatre which affects and, as he famously puts it, infects. So he describes theatre as being a plague Um, and one of my favourite quotes from the theatre and its double um, he states that if there is still one hellish, truly accursed thing in our time, it is our artistic dallying with forms instead of being like victims burnt at the stake, signalling through the flames. Um, I find that really exciting in um, that for me, when we look at a religious ritual or what we would call a performance in terms of a, sec- a secular performance, I think that um, we're getting slippage Um especially now um, in terms of immersive experiential theatre, um, different forms of performance art. Um, my research specifically looks at the intersection between um, art, magic and performance. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in where the way he troubles the boundary um, because he talks about wanting to exercise um, exercise society and individuals. He wants to um, affect the, the psychic architecture of his audience and so he really wants to break down the the relationship uh, that um where an audience member is uh in a, a dark room looking at bodies on a stage on a proscenium art stage he wants to break that down and destroy it and and put the experience and the meaning inside the body of the the spectator itself um so yeah <laughs> So would you say the um, manifesto is aimed at the spectators or the people on the stage? I think that the tricky thing with Arto that um, one thing that I probably should have pointed out um, earlier is that he was he was plagued by mental illness, and I think especially um, being born in the um, the late 1800s, he was born in 1896, so he was very much living through a time with the pathologization of the body and different forms of mental illness. He was incarcerated, institutionalised. Um, he was very much diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, he underwent shock treatment. And so in saying that, these letters and essays and manifestos are directed at no one subject it's it, he takes aim at the whole of society itself um, he sees in terms of religion uh, he sees um, that society in a really I would say Gnostic and it's been acknowledged by many scholars a real Gnostic dualist um, perspective in the binaries of good and evil heaven and hell um, God and the devil and he sees that this world that we're living in now that it's just an illusion and um, that really harkens back to the idea of the demiurge and Yala Badoff in that it is a false world, a false reality that's being constructed and we're trapped within it. And so he thought that through theatre, through this immersive theatre of cruelty, um, that this experience could liberate us 
from um, the the shackles of what he thought were the dark forces and the black magic of a malevolent culture. Um, I think it's it's really important to probably at this point really highlight um, sort of his the irony, I guess, where he thought about the failure of language itself in that um, in the definition of, of cruelty, he really took issue that so many people responded to his work in thinking he was suggesting that it was meaning blood and violence, although he does suggest in uh, one part of uh, the theatre and its double that if necessary, blood will be shed. Um, but he he means cruelty in, in the French sense um, that it's irresistible, that it you cannot take yourself away from it. Um, and I'm quoting here specifically from the theatre and its double now, um, quote, I use the word cruelty in the sense of hungering after life cosmic strictness, relentless necessity, in the Gnostic sense of a living vortex of engulfing darkness, in the sense of the inescapability and necessary pain without which life could not continue. Good has to be desired. It is the result of an act of willpower, while evil is continuous. So for Artaud, the the cruelty is necessary to life, but it's um, it's irresistible and... um, it's it's through this exp- cruel experience that we will be finally liberated from the illusion that we find ourselves in. Alana? Yes, Carol? I know Artaud mostly because of the influence that he had upon Peter Brook. Yes. And I've done quite a lot of work on because he's a member of the fourth way tradition, a follower of George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. Mm. Now, I think you've just told us some amazing stuff that we could unpack a bit further, which is about the relationship between theatre and ritual, perhaps yeah. in religious context? <laughs> I think um, working between theatre and and religion, um, as you point out, Carol, like ritual is it's such an important term and I think countless studies and books and um, there's been so much contest around what we mean by ritual and I think in a religious study sense, I think we're a lot more comfortable in unpacking the concept of ritual, whereas performance studies, we struggle sometimes with that division between secular and sacred. Um, I think that performance studies is, if I tell someone I work in in religious studies when I'm in a performance studies context, they look at me a little bit uh, askance, wondering if I'm talking about supernatural forces and God and the devil, which we can do. But um, I think within a religious studies context, ritual, when we talk about ritual, we we mean something that is effective. Um, And I I quite like the work that Jonathan Z. Smith does with ritual. Um, I think it's in his book, Reimagining Religion, Imagining Religion, From Jonestown to Babylon. And um, he talks about ritual and the sacred as being a a selective process and um, that it's through our ritualized action, um, it's the meaning and the affect that comes from the doing. And I think that that's something that Arto really tapped into. And if we think about when he's working, um, writing, working, he was in and out of institutions, um, but also working as a theatre director um, and as an actor himself, um, he was pointing to stuff that that is, I would say, is happening now, um, but he was 100 years ahead of his time I mean, he was literally you know the the I think Jane Goodall says he was the idealized martyr that could be misquoting um of, of failed artistic genius mm-hmm. and uh, Alana I, I know um Otto was into mysticism and had a number of <laughs> mystical experiences and visions bless him bless him he believed yeah that he had um he was in possession of a, a walking stick that had belonged to uh, saint patrick uh jesus christ and lucifer so it was um <laughs> it was well well used then <laughs> it was a well used walking stick. But yeah, he he did have these experiences and I think that you know this is would speak to your work Anna in terms of mystical experience and um hallucinogenics and treatment in so much as um the boundaries between uh what we would call a mystical experience and uh, uh an episode of mental illness they're really tenuous and um depending on what context we find ourselves in 
the the definition and the treatment would change. I think um, in the later years of his life, he um, Arto died in um, it was I think what was it? It was the fourth of March, nineteen forty eight. So he wasn't very old. He was only in his early fifties. Um, he'd spent the last five years in an institution in Paris, I think it was. Um, but before that, he was living in Ireland and he was having these apocalyptic visions of the landscape where he truly believed that um, the end times were approaching. Um, he believed at some points that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. There's a really famous episode where he was walking through the streets of Paris with a friend complaining of the pain in his hands and his wrists um, from the time when he was crucified um, on, the, on the mound. Um, so he was, he was a troubled individual most definitely, but uh, in his, his writings they're just – the last five years he produced 20,000 pages of notebooks that I think now are, um, there was an exhibition a few years ago of what he, he terms their, their magic spells, their incantations. He uses drawing as a way um, of sigils and manifestation as well. Um, so there's so much religious and spiritual discourse bound up in his work because he he very much wanted to exercise what he saw as the um, – the, the evil forces that were hidden within us, very much like the, the ancient Gnostic traditions. Did he try to induce these mystical experiences or, or did they just happen spontaneously for him? I think it was um, sort of column A, column B. I think he definitely had um, genetic, um, genetic instances and structures. I mean, in terms of psychology, that's not my area of research. He'd probably be much better versed, Anna, but... Um, he he also was involved with drug taking, and um, in that regard, there was drug taking. But also, um, he was a willing participant when he was institutionalized um, in various instances of electroshock treatment. I think in the last five years, um, there were countless instances um, where he underwent treatment. Um, in the end, he he was desirous to be, um, as he very famously put it a body without organs and um i think when there's just so much in his writing i think it's it's really hard to peg it all down into one short podcast um but some of the the language that he uses in his writing in his manifestos it's, it's visceral um it, it is violent um and he he talks about um smashing through language in order to touch life um i think it's it's there's one really beautiful or beautiful in its in its horror i would say that um he wants to agitate the soul and he says that um this is again i quote from the theater and it's double the secret is to irritate those pressure points as if the muscles were flayed the rest is achieved by screams it's um i think it's very famous that um or scholars would say that he famously never realized his theatre of cruelty, that he's this poster child of the avant-garde, the tortured genius of mental illness. But um, I think that in what we're seeing now, you look at, um, or even in the 1960s counterculture, um, you would get the the performance happenings. Um, you eventually got fluxus, which isn't quite the same as what he's pointing to, but theatre really begins to be opened up um, in the 1960s with the avant-garde counterculture and they explore the physical and psychic extremes of, of their practice and they really sought from what Arto was calling for the, the liberation of performance from text and, and what they saw as the bourgeois institution of, of literary drama. Um, so you get the performance group very famously with their work uh, Dionysus in 69. Um, you get beat poetry with like Ginsberg. And as uh, Carol pointed out, you get Peter Brook, also Jersey Grotowski. Um, I would even say that John Cage's performance uh, was at 433. That, in a way, I think that somewhere points to where Otto was taking us. Um, and I think because I'm thinking about manifestos, I was thinking about um, Valerie Solanus. It's been argued that her assassination attempt of Andy Warhol was a radical piece of performance art and that it is one of the first iterations of realisation of um, Artaud's cruelty, theatre of cruelty, in that the boundary between performer and spectator was obliterated 
but she staged managed everything that she had uh, a trench coat and a paper bag she left at the um at Warhol's factory contained a, a pistol her address book and a sanitary napkin um she obliterates the boundary between performance and reality and spectator I frivolously said I'd talk about the scum manifesto. I know. We made this program. But, of course, I withdrew from it. But one of the things that you have just pointed to, Alana, is actually the context of the Society of the Spectacle, Guy Debord's piece, which was published in French in 1967 and became kind of globally relevant with the Paris riots of 1968. And the whole point of the Society of the Spectacle is a kind of upgrade of Marxist ideas about society where essentially the real ceases to have any meaning and the only thing that has meaning is the spectacle, which is a kind of a con produced so that people can consume it by viewing and being alienated rather than, you know, enlightened. So in some senses, the society of the spectacle is like an anti-arto. Um, it suggests that what's happened by the 1960s is that there's the production of spectacle constantly which actually distracts people from the recognition of anything pointing to the wheel. It has implications for politics and for religion. I was just going to say, I mean, I am a massive Guy Debord fanboy, uh, as most people might know. But no, I was just going to say, while listening to Alana talk about Ardtord, um, that there seem to be an awful lot of parallels between the two. You know, they kind of wanted to break barriers down that were keeping people from seeing the reality. Um, mm. And I think it's sort of, I don't know if it's just a French thing, considering they're both French. <laughs> um, and as we all know, the French philosophers are the fun ones. Um, but, yeah, no, it's just, that's just what I was sort of thinking when, when while Alana was talking. Um, I think it, 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 it's sort of that. It's two different paths, but both from the same agitation where they go. Mm. Arto wants you to go further in, in into that, right into the experience, right into the centre. Whereas Guy Debord, I think in a very similar way to Bertolt Brecht, really, where it is to take you right outside of it so you can see it for what it is. Almost definitely. Um, yeah, I think there's there's two different two different approaches. Um, but I think, yeah, it's it, it, and, and I would I would also say that you know Arto's work is definitely bound up in sort of the convergence of art and politics and um, you know magic and and religion and the secular and the sacred. Whereas I, in terms of Debord's work, I, I mean my my favorite example was, of Debord was a punk band I love, the Manic Street Breaches. They wanted <laughs> to. I think borrow from from his manifesto and create for their their first LP. They wanted it in a sandpaper jacket so that it would rub up against all the other um, records stacked against it. But I don't think they were allowed to. That was their little almost debord protest to the manufacturer and capital and art. But um, yeah, so I, I think with debord and the. Um, where where would be like Carol? What would your thoughts be in terms of religious parallels? With- I'm not sure that there are religious parallels. Like certainly, Debord's not that interested, for example, in things like ritual, which would be significant in the context of the theatre. What he's interested in is the way in which most people, and he thought by 1967, fuck knows what he'd have thought looking at all of us now. Uh, he thought by 1967 that the experience of being had been completely displaced by the experience of having. The only things that people were interested in were material possessions. But what they didn't understand was that being reduced to that was like an ultimate 
capitalist situation where there wasn't really anything that a person could do to create meaning apart from consume. And um, it makes me think, you know, it, it is actually um, a French thing. There's a whole lot of people in the 1960s who were worrying about that sort of thing. Um, there are novelists and artists who are asking questions about why is it that everybody wants all this stuff and what do they think the stuff is about? Um Du Bois' Society of the Spectacle is actually structured properly as a manifesto. It's the manifesto of the Situationist International, the um, neo-Marxist group, which he was the chief spokesman of. And if you look at some of the theses, some are pithier than others, and they point more strongly to things that he sees as huge problems. So he says in Thesis 44, the spectacle is a permanent opium war raged to make it impossible to distinguish goods from commodities or true satisfaction from a survival that increases according to its own logic. Consumable survival must increase, in fact, because it continues to enshrine deprivation the reason there is nothing beyond augmented survival and no end to its growth is that survival itself belongs to the realm of dispossession. It may gild poverty, but it cannot transcend it. Now, when you look at that, you think, well, that doesn't really have to do with religion, and it may it not does even it. be that clear. But if you start thinking about the fact that Bourg killed himself in 1994, shot himself, um, and by maybe the end of that decade, towards the year 2000, there were a number of religious studies theorists beginning to write about how the dominance of material commodification in religion was a kind of massive problem. And there were those people who came from like a strictly dismissive perspective, like Jeremy Carrett and what's his name, King, whom I've forgotten, who wrote a book called Selling Spirituality, which is extremely dismissive and critical. And then you get somebody like David Lyon, who in 2000, only six years after de Boer kills himself, writes an extraordinary book, very short, very light, very easy to read, called Jesus in Disneyland, that starts talking about how is it that even you know, quite traditional religious people around about the turn of the third millennium are basically engaging with consumerist models at every point to calculate themselves, to encounter the divine, to have peak experiences. What most matters is consumption. And, of course, since then, other theorists and writers, including people that I admire very much, I'm thinking perhaps of Francois Gauthier and Thomas Martikoinen, who wrote, uh, well, edited a book called Religion in Consumer Society, Brands, Consumers and Markets, that I remember reviewing a few years ago. It was published in 2013. Um, they were interested to point out how even religious institutions in the 21st century actually had um, absorbed all of this stuff, which in some sense should have been a critique of their operation, but rather than viewing it as a critique, they'd incorporated it and started operating themselves within the modes of consumption. So poor old de Bord, I think he would have been completely <laughs> horrified by the idea that we are not upset or perhaps not upset enough by his critique of consumerism. And, of course, the Society of the Spectacle is, to some extent, it's a neo-Marxist manifesto. So it looks back to... Um, 
Marx's Communist Manifesto, and it looks at ideas that Marx and Engels developed about religion, you know, that in some sense it, um, it's a narcotic that stops people from engaging in revolutionary consciousness. But Debord looked towards the intense mediatization of our existence in really interesting ways. Like in 1967 in Paris, the internet was not a thing. Um, and for the majority of people who weren't actually IT geeks, it wasn't a thing until 1989 when Tim Berners-Lee introduces the World Wide Web interface, which made it available to a lot of people who were non-specialists. But Debord in the Society of the Spectacle um, launches some pretty powerful attacks on the hollowness, for example, of celebrity. So there's a lot of discussion about fame and about mediatization, which at that point meant television and film. We see like a more intense version. And I think one of the reasons why I find this such an interesting text is because it's one of those texts where it's like the mythical or folkloric idea about meeting a doppelganger and dying. You know, we've <laughs> seen the enemy and it's us. We've seen the future and, oh, heck, you know, it's here and it's horrible and we kind of like it. And I think every time you think about Pentecostal megachurches, sex scandals, mediatized Christian music, um, Christian television apocalyptic series put up on channels that only all the fundamentalists in America watch, um, we are seeing what Debord saw well, over 50 years ago. And I find it interesting. I don't like using the word prophet because basically, because I'm old, I had to do religious studies when you could only do old religion. And I know that prophets in the Old Testament, for example, are not actually supposed to be people who see the future. They're kind of social critics. Now, the board's a social critic but he also is somebody who could see the future and it was pretty horrible, which I think is probably obviously an invitation for either Sophie or Ray because their manifestos go beyond, I think, what we've discussed so far. Um, yeah, so the Unabomber, um, a.k.a. Ted Kaczynski or other way around, um, he's really fascinating to study in terms of his manifesto because I think his manifesto is something that kind of gets overlooked with a lot of the, um, with his kind of story. Um, he's more commonly more well-known for his uh, prolific uh, serial killing. Um, I think it took a took about 20 years before he was finally captured um, and sentenced. Um, and it definitely kind of covers a lot of that that has already been raised by Alana in terms of actually um, enacting an ideology of a manifesto um, and also going off of uh, Carol's discussion of Debord is that what was inspiring him, what was inspiring him was a, a rejection of society and everything that he saw was wrong with society. Um, so the big kind of motivation uh, for the Unabomber Manifesto um, is that it was this kind of recognition that society and its technology um, was becoming too advanced for the people, like for humans. Um, and that humans were starting to change their behaviour in order to conform with technology rather than using technology as a tool to, to enhance them. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess going off of what Alana was saying, something that I find really interesting with 
uh, the discussions of the manifestos is that kind of how is it being enacted? How are these ideas being carried out? And uh, the Unabomber Manifesto is really interesting to study from that respect because it was something that was um, being actively carried out by Ted Kaczynski um, and that would inevitably lead to, to his arrest was the publication of his manifesto. Do you think it's um, inspired anybody after his arrest, though? Yeah, there's definitely been um, definitely been quite a few people that have been inspired by by it. Um, there's several groups that are emerging even today um, that are kind of playing off of this idea of like rewilding and, and rejecting modern society. Um, and of course, it also leads into your own um, your own manifesto that you're discussing, Ray, um, of Anders Breivik. Before we jump back over to Ray, I'm so fascinated by this idea of rewilding because it's something that I have seen, I guess, in social media and, and you know, wellness media, um, but I had no idea that it had links to the Unabomber Manifesto. <laughs> um, so, V, can you that. tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I, it, it's kind of, that's why I found it really fascinating reading up on it again, because it, it he kind of was one of the first to really raise this issue that that humans need to return to this more uh, quote unquote primitive lifestyle um, in order to like shake off the, the negative aspects of modern society. Um, but I think that also plays, it, it plays into this kind of like narrative of, of what are we going back to? Um, which is definitely being raised in uh, probably the stuff that you're reading as well. So. so so what does he think we are going back to? He never really makes it clear, which is really something really frustrating about his manifesto. And I think it's a, a common theme across manifestos is that there isn't really a, a clear direction of, of where he wants to go. Um, he he has this kind of ambiguous term of just like primitive and pre-modern and anti-civilization, yet he's writing within a civilization. He's using a typewriter to write these things. He's creating bombs with modern kind of technology. So it's it's very confusing. And I, I think that's that's something that often gets overlooked with those that he's inspiring, is that they kind of have this kind of very ambiguous idea of, of what they're trying to reject um, and what they want to just like get away from but there's nothing that they're actually going towards um, and I guess he tries to justify this by claiming that uh, society is only through the collapse of society that a new more positive society can be built up um, so he's more interested in actually destroying and and getting rid of everything than actually giving any practical tips on where we can go in the future. Well, I think probably, Sophie, that makes me want to ask about the relationship between, say, ecology and spirituality or perhaps religion. I mean, is it one of his, is it his ultimate concern to use the old Paul Tillich take? I guess considering that question, it's something that's never really clearly defined in his manifesto. Um, he never really goes into very specific religious or even really political um, uh, concepts. Um, what I find more interesting in terms of that is is what it's inspiring um, and how it's being interpreted um, by the audience because I think that's where a lot of the the ecology and spirituality comes into it as people are uh, taking it up and interpreting it and uh, kind of trying to act on it. Um, it's something that's definitely been picked up on um, by many of the kind of anarcho primitives and the uh, very extreme environmentalists who are using it as a sort of justification um, for having extreme acts of of kind of protest against uh, society. Um, and it's something that's increasing even up to today. Uh, we see the things like Extinction Rebellion that are uh, just completely not at a loss, but they're looking for new ways to reject what they're seeing as the ills of, of kind of rapid social change and uh, the kind of negative impact of, of technology. So, um 
yeah, definitely more in terms of, of what it's inspiring, which I think is something that is interesting to consider if manifestos in general, because while we can consider who's writing it and what's inspiring them, um, I think their big impact is is what it's in turn inspiring and who's interpreting it and actually acting on it. Absolutely. I, I was just thinking sort of from left field that there's that old story about the Velvet Underground, that their first record sold very few units, but the people who did buy their first album went on to form, I think, you know, Talking Heads, Sonic Youth, like all these incredible bands. And so you go, where is, for manifestos more broadly, apart from, you know, rock music, but where, how do we, are we assessing a manifesto by the people that it goes on to inspire? And I mean, obviously we are talking about some very serious, horrific crimes out of these manifestos in terms of Ray and um, and Sophie's. But yeah, how do how do we think we would judge a manifesto? Does it need to does it need to be realized by its author or those that it inspires? Because I think that's that's something that's I think and then we can slip into religion as well. Do we value a religion on and its validity by its followers? I and think if, I think if you look at something like Guy Debord and like the Society of the Spectacle, um, ever mm. since he died, it's basically gone off on a tangent. Where you know, like the concept of the derive is just become completely it's, separate to <laughs> what he'd wanted. You know, it's an app now. It's an app, yeah. You can down- like it's no you longer a um, app. yeah, it's no longer a um, a, a, an art thing. You know, it's it's now like a you know, go off and go for a wander and a, a street ramble, if you will, mm. um, and Instagram it. And hashtag Instagram it, Gitterball. yeah, which would just hashtag really hashtag annoy the is. crap out of him, I think. Um, he would hate it. But it brings me back to a question um, that was posed earlier, which is, um, you know, what's the direction of these manifestos? Where are we going with them? You know, so it's like if someone like like um, Ted Kaczynski or Anders Breivik had a direct way they wanted to go, like they, they were writing for somewhat of a future. But, you know, Artaud and Debord were just sort of like wanting to reclaim their present. Which I guess, you know, maybe that's just a generational thing. I think that's a great issue, Ray. It's really good. Um, and Alana, going back to your thing about buying the Velvet Underground because <laughs> album, because, you know, there's another myth. And it comes out of, is it the first Sex Pistols gig? There are only 28 20. people or something and they all went on to form yeah. a band, yeah. To form bands, you know. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, the perfection is in the recognition that this is the path that we must tread. And I often think about that in terms of new religious movements because someone like L. Ron Hubbard, for example, there's an enormous number of people who understood, trained, took on the Scientology tech in various ways and then went off and did other things with it, which actually drove him bonkers and he really didn't like it. But that didn't stop them. So in some senses he's like an astonishingly fertile and powerful influence whether or not we like the idea. So when you think about people like the Unabomber and Anders Bear and Breivik, you're thinking about people whose impact was violent and terrifying and criminal and yet perhaps inspirational. Ray, do you want to step in and tell us about Bravey? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit loath to, uh, to call someone who killed an awful lot of children uh, brave and uh, inspirational. Um, I mean, maybe to a certain subset of people, including and not limited to um, Brenton Tarrant, who is most famous for a year ago. Was it a year ago or two years ago? So the the Christchurch shootings, um, which, yeah, like the anniversary. It was, it was an anniversary over the weekend, I think. Um, but, yeah, you know, this is a guy who was so concerned about 
who is slightly an eco terrorist. He, you know, believed that the earth needed to be saved, but the easiest way to save the earth is to stop Muslim birth rates because it's always about the birth rates, as the first line of Tarrant's uh, manifesto also wrote, uh, is said. Um, but yeah, so you know, to save the world, he killed a bunch of people, and I think. There's certain issues with that, but I mean, then his manifesto itself was um, like why he did it, how he did it, and then basically ripped off a whole bunch of other people, um, including Ted Kaczynski, um, to sort of, he he changed a few of the words to suit his own um, situation, his own ideas. Um, But yeah, so Ted Kaczynski, the Arabia myth, which, you know, uh, Europe is going to turn into Arabia at some point soon. Um, Yeah, it's not a very nice thing to read, and that's why I said I'd do it. <laughs> How would you link Breivik to religion? Well, that's the thing, because if you read the manifesto, he he keeps carrying on about the Knights Templar, and it's like Get out. he keeps saying that he, he keeps saying he is a member of this order of the Knights Templar, which there is a Masonic order, which is the Knights Templar, which he wasn't a member of. But, you know, he, he's this whole crusade aspect thing. Um, and, you know, then he's like the whole anti-Islam aspect makes him sound very Christian. But if you ask him now, apparently he's coming out on record as saying uh, he's an Odinist, which in itself is, you know, um, these days it's just essentially another code word for white supremacist anyway. Um, so the, the religious aspect, I guess, is just, at some point he felt like a Christian need to sort of cleanse um, Europe, which is still, it's still um, an idea that carries on today um, through an awful lot of people. But I think as well, more broadly um, for religious studies, again, to bring up Jonathan Z. Smith, um, the, I think in his writings about the immediate aftermath of Jonestown and what he saw as the failing of the discipline um, is in religious studies to really tackle what had happened in its in its discourse and to talk about how we can approach these atrocities that are done in, in you know in the name of religion or whether they borrow from religious discourse or practice or ideology. Um, do do you think it do you think it's our responsibility as academics, as as scholars of religion, to to engage with these manifestos, or as you know, Jacinta Ardern, where she doesn't want to name the, she doesn't want to talk about the Christ, the the perpetrator of the Christchurch Christchurch massacre, you know, doesn't want to give him that you know satisfaction to be named. Where where do you think we sit, Ray, as a as a discipline? Do should we be looking at these manifestos and going, we need to tackle this so it doesn't happen again? Um, that's, what do you think? That's where I'm at with it. I think you won't mm-hmm. be able to stop them, but if, you, you know, like enough manifestos being written, you'll at least be able to see where these people are coming from. Um, like I've got, I've got an entire folder of manifestos on my computer, which is a very strange thing to say, I, I feel. Um, but you know, like you read enough of them and it's sort of hopefully like as, as, uh, in the role of a, of an academic or a scholar is, you know, sort of like taking one for the team and reading these things so that other people don't, but also, you know, being able to pick out the, the, the religious elements that, you know, journalists might not because journalists will have access to them as well. You know, they usually freely put them up on the internet, um, and link to them. I know Tarrant did, you know, straight up to 8chan or 4chan. Um, And, yeah, you know, so it's like if we can get to them and actually analyse them through some form of religious studies modality, I think it would actually help out a lot more. At least the current ones, like the the older ones are a bit, you know, um, nicer, I guess, as we found out this evening. So... Well, maybe not, Ray. You could argue that there were older and totally horrible white supremacist manifestos. And I'm thinking about things like, say, 
we could bring something like the protocols of the elders. Oh yeah, on. well that's true. But also, you know, just you know, we could go straight to movies and Birth of a Nation. I'm not sure that they are necessarily nastier. The difference is that they're mediated in a different way. True. As you say, they're freely available all over the internet. Hmm. And they they usually shared a lot more now. That ease of access of being able to share them amongst like minded people. So. That's something that I've always found quite interesting um, and even listening to, to Alana and Carol discuss their manifestos is the, the shift in how they're being uh, kind of published and shared around because um, I know for a fact that uh, Ted Kaczynski was very explicit in stating that he didn't want to actually publish his manifesto in a conventional way because it wouldn't get that message across like it wouldn't get that readership um it was only through his acts of of uh terrorism and then getting it published in major newspapers that he actually got that readership um and i guess the same could be said um in your case ray is is it is the the act that's associated with the manifesto that has a big impact as well true yeah i mean i doubt We'd be sitting here talking about it if uh, Breivik had failed to get to the island and actually managed to do anything. But, yeah, I think you're right. I think, so. you raise a really interesting point because if you cut it down the middle for this evening, you look at Carol and I, our manifestos, we've got people who are trying to call others to action, whereas with yourself and um, and Foray, we've got, um, people who have written documents to sort of, I don't know, frame or not justify is not the right word, but, um, yeah, to sort of land and ground their subsequent atrocities in a document just to sort of outline like the inside of their thinking and their process. And I think in that regard maybe we've got two different, we're dealing with two different beasts maybe, even though they're both or well, they're all sort of under the umbrella of, manifesto the concept and they might use the same language I don't like brevik for you he was writing to basically try and inspire more people to follow him and um that, you know, yeah, take that, up that the call true, to yeah. arms yeah something that uh ted kaczynski really tried to get across with his and it, it's never really explicitly stated but you really get that that sense is that he really wanted to reinforce how much he disliked society and he wanted to get people to understand that and kind of agree with him um, because at the end of the day he really wanted people to kind of come together and uh, just increase the social stress so that the system would eventually break down. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely more of a call to arms. Um, I don't think it's necessarily inspiring people to do the same things that he did, um, but he he's definitely trying to get some kind of revolution happening. Yeah, I mean, it's the same with Tarrant. He's trying to enthrall more people who might want to defend the homeland. Um, and, well, I mean, it worked 10 years later in Christchurch, which is still strange. It's a, a, an Australian in New Zealand defending Europe, which makes some sense, I assume, to someone. Well, that raises the question about whether a manifesto has a universal call or whether it doesn't, Ray. Um, Kaczynski is American. Debord and Otto are French. Um, Brenton Tarrant is an Australian in New Zealand. And as Breivik is a Norwegian. It always shocked me amongst my Swedish academic friends after the Breivik attacks all the Swedes said it should have been us. It's Sweden that had a <laughs> problem with right-wing oh, yeah. arms stockpilers. And Norway, poor Norway, how did this even turn out to be a thing? And I guess perhaps Australia had a little bit of the same sort of feeling about Tarrant when we heard about the Christchurch mosque attacks. I think so, especially when you start looking at our own little groupings, particularly down in Melbourne. We'd like to hang out in the Grampians over over the holidays. 
So I think it it also points to a, a bigger question in terms of manifestos or a broader question, I should say, when we go back to that idea of the the line between and met like the the what is di- like social and political, artistic or religious dissent, and the slip into criminal actions and violence, and it kind of feels like any. Do we think manifestos are inherently violent, or I don't know, problematic texts? Because now I, I'm you know I'm well, they call for destruction, right? They call for anarchy. They call for revolution. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it it it's almost like this. Impo- each manifesto, although you know there there are some, depending on which one we're talking about, there are some really horrible things done in the name of the manifesto. Mm. Um, is it ever possible for a manifesto to be to be fully realized, or is it inherently a doomed text? Like it, it's an impossible text because I know that you know with with Arto, um, his the irony being of his work and that he rails against the, you know, the, or the, the failing of language and the, and, and how language will never be sufficient. And it's, um, it's worthless. And yet he finds himself writing and having to rely on language to try and communicate his ideas. And I guess to a point people find that's the reason that they find it so, um, so obscure. <laughs> what are you talking about? And he's like, well, that's my point. Um, do we do we think manifestos are just inherently doomed to fail? Ooh, I mean, it's interesting. This like, if we could find a manifesto that has actually taken life after the fact, I guess. I'm trying to think of one now. I think we have to accept that human phenomena, society, dynasties, religions, civilizations, all fail. That is the story. And there's this sense in which if you want to go for a sort of individual and the cosmos, microcosm, macrocosm relationship, just as every individual dies, every society ends. I mean, it's bleak, but true. Well, as as all things must come to an end, I think this podcast now must come to an end because we've reached our time. But sorry to leave on that that note, but um, it's a bit of a philosophical thought for everyone. Um, but I wanted to thank Carol, Ray, Sophie, and Alana for joining us tonight. It was an, a fascinating conversation. Um, and hopefully we can get together again for another one of these roundtables in the future. Thanks again to our guests for such a fascinating conversation and really thought-provoking discussion. This was a really interesting episode. And if you think so too, please head over to our social media accounts to continue this conversation. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You can find us over on Twitter at Project RS or Find us on Facebook at The Religious Studies Project. We'd love to know what you think. And if you have enjoyed this podcast and want to help support the great work of our team, please visit us on our website at religiousstudiesproject.com. And we would absolutely appreciate any support you could give us at patreon.com slash project RS. A monthly donation, even if it's just a couple of bucks, would go a long way to support the work of everybody here. And also, be sure to use our Amazon affiliate links whenever you're buying anything on Amazon, whether you're stocking up on some more books or just ordering a few things for the house. And those links can be found on our website as well. So until next time, I think all that's left to say is thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Brianne Fallon and David McConaughey and founding editors Chris Cotter, that's me, and David Robertson, that's the other guy. Our features are edited by Rebecca Barrett-Fox and Lauren Osborne and our Opportunities Digest by Ella Buck. Audio editing by Alex Matthews, 
Podcast transcription by Andy Alexander and Savannah Finver, and social media managed by Ray Radford and Candice Mixon. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon affiliate links or donating at patreon.com backslash project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, and other portals. Thanks for listening.